Soshi, welcome. We're really excited to have you. Um, for those of you who are not yet familiar with Sochi's work, uh, so she's a former Muay Thai champion, um, general movement badass. Uh, she's somebody who I've heard about in the community for a long time before we got a chance to talk. Um, she's worked uh, with Ida Portal as an apprentice of Ida Portal and works extensively with Finding Monkey, is now working at Praxis in Canberra um, and has you know, many different strains of approaches to movement and a lot of, different, a lot of deep philosophy behind her approach. Uh, she's someone whose voice I'm really excited to bring here and and have uh, shared with you guys and, and really projected more because I think that she's someone that uh, that has a lot to share with the world and hasn't yet been as discovered as she should be. So, Soji, thank you. Thank you so much, Rafe, and everyone for being here and for having me. It's um, a real pleasure and a real honor. Um, I have prepared a presentation. And before I do that, I will share um, a tiny bit about myself. Race has already done a beautiful introduction. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, um, I'll give you a bit of background. Oh, I hope this construction is not too bad. We'll just go with it, go with the flow. Um, so my name is Soy Shi. I live in Australia and I teach here. And I grew up uh, over eight different countries. So there was a lot of change and different multicultural environments for, in my life throughout. And at university, I studied anthropology. Um, and throughout the last 15 years, I have practiced different martial arts and movement practices. And I have been teaching for the past eight years or so. Um, the last two years, my practice and journey have been going more inwards. So I've gone to India several times to study meditation and spiritual practices. I have a guru there. And what I will present to you today and the work that I've been doing has really been um, me amalgamating all of this these different worlds and chapters that have made up my life. And I'm trying to just share with you what um, has been most uh, beneficial and wonderful for me as a human being and as a teacher. So my topic today is called moving towards a higher self. So let me just go to a share screen. And... Okay, everyone, oh, I guess, um, Rafe, can you give a thumbs up if you can see this? Fine, okay, good, so the presentation works so far, awesome. So, it is moving towards a higher self. Um, I have been working with movement for many years, and throughout um, investing a lot of time and energy and love and effort into physical practice and movement. And a big question that came has been coming up for me uh, throughout my life is, what do we ultimately want? Why do we do what we do? Uh, what do human beings want? And ultimately, it is this desire to feel free and happy and loved and abundant. And um, for me, this is what the higher self actually is. But there are other aspects to ourselves that create opportunities and obstacles for this journey that we take in life. So I will start by discussing a little bit about the self. I've made a little self and a big self for this slide. So the, with the little self, I am referring to the egoic self, which we all have. And it's not uh, a bad thing, but it's just as it is. It is the ever-changing, restless mind and the physical aspects of you that seek validation from external accomplishments. So those things that we're seeking, the peace, the joy, the freedom, they come from looking outside by doing certain things that that help us to feel them and then there is a higher self which is the pure complete 
boundless, innately kind, wise, powerful, intelligent, compassionate, peaceful, content inner being. So the core of ourselves. And there are obstacles that um, prevent us from being able to feel this, this higher self and all these beautiful qualities that we really strive to uh, experience in our life. So here are some of them. There tends to be in almost every human being a feeling of not being enough. And this is where um, we feel like, oh, if I achieve something great, then I can experience self-value, like the world will celebrate me and I can feel better, like I have a university degree or I can do a chin up or again, based on doing um, to try and feel like we are enough but innately not feeling enough. A sense of self-worth coming from the outside. So again, maybe making a lot of money or buying nice objects or demonstrating beautiful skills. Um, things, when we get our self-value from that, we end up becoming attached to those things. So when we lose them, uh, the great suffering happens. So you see athletes who get injured, it can become a completely devastating existence um, if they cannot cope well with, with, with their attachment to their, their body and their achievements. Habits and tendencies that are limiting. So we all know we have bad habits and some of them we work on, others we go, okay, we can do that later, that's fine. And we also have unconscious habits that we don't always feel unless we um, they unless they get exposed through events and suffering or we're doing that inner work. So those habits do prevent us from being our highest self. Living and practicing movement, so living a life um, day by day and having a movement practice that is mechanical creates an autopilot life. And this means that we're just kind of, I think it should be on the next point. We're following protocols and ticking boxes and always only projecting into the future of what will be achieved in the future. Um, and usually there's a kind of discontentment until the thing is achieved. And whether a contentment comes when you achieve it or not is a different thing. I like to call this the adult disease, and I will speak more about this um, into the presentation, as well as different cures, which include childlike qualities. So it was awesome to have Rafe's children start um, this, this part of the summit. Um, it really ties into what I want to share. Basically, with being an adult, um, it can be a really awesome, expansive, empowering thing, or it can be just uh, a thing of ticking boxes, you know, going to uni, buying a house, um, getting married, buying a pet, having kids, uh, and then in the movement practice, checking different skill sets one after the other without really um, enjoying the presence of each action or hearing an inner voice. So I will talk about all of this shortly. Our entire education consists precisely in learning a whole repertoire of attitudes of thinking and feeling and attitudes of moving. This repertoire consists our automatism, but we do not know it. So again, if we're only um, repeating action without being present, we don't really feel or create. Um, and for most of us, that becomes uh, a semi-permanent existence. And everyone can relate to uh, being in your house and going into the kitchen or another room and not knowing why you went there um, or forget forgetting, had I brushed my teeth this morning or not? Because there is this kind of autopilot thing. Once we've learned something, it's just stored and we mechanically repeat the action rather than 
um, being present with it and even appreciating it. So how can we cure this so-called adult disease? Having an embodied practice that requires you to be present and hear your own inner voice. And this one was a huge one for my personal journey because there were many times where I did uh, practice from this inner calling, inner curiosity, but there were also a few years where I was pretty much ticking boxes and trying to achieve things that were culturally rewarded, valued, glorified, so that um, I could feel better, but none of it was coming from my personal creative expression. It was more following a rigid process or protocol. Using movement to better understand how your mind works and repatterning it. So when you move, you are engaging with the world and with others. And there's always a kind of internal dialogue that goes on as we interact with the world and with other people. And when we move with them and play with them. So when we can bring our awareness to how our mind actually works, we can expose it for what it is. Um, for example, you are playing a game with a partner and you don't feel like you're being successful in that game. So the mind may start to blame the partner for not playing nicely or not playing the way you want them to play. And this kind of thought doesn't serve your higher self and it does not serve your partner or anyone else really. So being able to observe how your mind is moving while your body is moving gives you the opportunity to change it to serve yourself and others. So perhaps seeing it like, oh, this is interesting. I'm not liking this experience, um, but why is that? And can I change my attitude to it? If I see it from fresh eyes, maybe it's a whole new game altogether. Doing inner work like meditation and self-inquiry are crucial um, for not becoming a mechanical adult that um, builds strong attachments and ends up suffering through, <laughs> through loss. Challenging ourselves through movement to expose our inner dialogue. So it's pretty similar to the previous point but the challenge part is quite important because if we only do things that are fun and um, pleasurable, then there's not a really honest or accurate reference point. So when we feel challenged, like we're doing strength work or, or struggling with balance or trying to mentally solve a coordination, that really does draw out an inner dialogue. Um, one, how you actually learn or resolve the challenge or the problem. So all the different tactics and um, wonderful methods that come up. But more importantly, how you speak to yourself. So if you are chasing a skill and um, you have a negative self-talk, and again, this is coming from my own experience and I've seen a lot of my peers have something similar where it's like, oh, I'll, I will never get this or I got it, but it's really crap. It's poor quality or I can't do it or I didn't sleep enough last night. So maybe I should take a rest. All of this dialogue, again, um, needs to be exposed so that work can be done so that we can elevate ourselves past it and not be limited by it. Learning through playing with others. This part I will speak about uh, even more shortly. Expressing creativity co to combat autopilot. Um, this really is very powerful and something that has become, uh, how do I say, really central in my physical practice, in my teaching, and trickling into daily life. So if you take something, a mundane movement practice that we most of us need to do, like cleaning the floor, 
if you can look at it from the point of view of being a four-year-old, so maybe you remember there was a time where you saw your mother sweeping and that looked like a game to you and you wanted to also play that game. Um, that's very different to being an adult and feeling like, oh, the floor is dirty. I have... 20 other things to do today. I'm just going to get it done and over with as quick as possible. And I probably will not be present while I'm doing it. I'll be thinking about the next task while I'm sweeping. And if you can bring in that childlike curiosity to all your activities, that will kill the autopilot mode because it, it just, it trumps it. Um, and life is much more juicy and awesome and exciting. How to work with movement. So a few steps that um, have come to me that are quite important for getting inner and outer progress through movement. First is observation, paying attention. So this means you cannot be on autopilot and just rock up and start doing your warm up. So um, if you're doing ankle rotations, or moving your hips in a circle just because it's easy. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't care about it or you're not feeling or paying attention. It involves paying attention to the environment you're in, the people you are with, um, your physical state, your inner state. So it means being present, basically. Awareness, taking in what you have been paying attention to. Self-reflection would be a way of processing um, what you have taken in. So again, using the example of watching your inner dialogue, um, you process it like, oh, okay, cool, that's, that's how it's working today. It's better than yesterday or maybe not. Um, or this is the state of my friends or this person is struggling or the, the, the forest or the ocean I'm training in, that's how they are and this is how I will need to adapt myself to be. So there's a kind of internal processing to, from the external um, reality. And then setting an intention of what needs to be done. Um, which should be conscious work, not unconscious work. So how you will make the most of that moment and situation. And finally, conscious action. Um, and without this, the first four are not very useful. So if we observe and are aware and self-reflect and set a good intention, but we do nothing about it, then that remains like just an inspiring esoteric idea that will never come to fruition. So we need to uh, rewire our neural pathways, means changing what the brain has uh, taken to be um, habit, right? Creating better habits. So if the, the, let's say the observation is something like laziness, and then you're aware that you're lazy, um, and then you process perhaps where is this coming from? There may be other things in your life that need attention or a different attitude. And then you set the intention to not be lazy and not skip your training session. So this is just an example so that this stuff becomes more uh, relatable. You set the intention. You actually have to show up. Um, and and do the work and you can't just show up once you have to show up day by day or week by week whatever the consistency is that that's not so important at this stage but it's it's taking action to make the internal and the external change meditation and spiritual practices are most important for making inner progress they bring our attention away from the busy world that is constantly distracting us, pulling our attention, uh, encouraging us to go into that autopilot mode. And they bring our attention, meditation and spiritual practices bring our attention into ourselves and the higher self, the, the content, peaceful core that you are. However, 
inner practices alone are not enough. Why are inner practices practiced on their own not enough? Consciousness is embodied and wants to express itself physically. So there's a reason why we, we occupy this amazing vehicle, which is our body, and relate to the world and everyone else and the environment and even our inner state through it. So the body cannot be uh, neglected and the action part also comes out through the physical uh, manifestation. We experience, internalize, and react through the body. So that's where the body is this very awesome entry point for the inner processing. Um, we cannot not be um, physically present and, and our actions basically communicate our inner state, our inner intentions. Both internal and external practices need to be embodied. They need to be applied on the playing field of the physical world. So that is again, bringing um, internal truths and making them real, manifesting them in the world that we live in, making them a living reality. How can movement help to cultivate this higher self? Movement should not be used as a tool to distract you from yourself. And this is another uh, big one. Again, it was for me, at least for a, for a long period of time. Um, I got a lot of um, empowerment and discipline and positive qualities from practicing movement intensely for a decade and a half. But it was also like um, for myself, as it was for many of my peers, both in martial arts and the other different movement practices, a form of escapism. And this can happen not just with movement, with any hobby or anything that you can do pretty much. And it, it could even turn to Use, abusing substance or being addicted to sleep. So as long as movement is not used as a form of escapism, then it's still helping you to move towards your higher self. It can really help you to understand and celebrate who you are and how you express yourself in the world. More than the action being performed, it is the inner state of the practitioner that matters. And we can see this when, when we see um, something like a dance, for example, when it is really expressed from the inner being, from the feeling of the performer, or when it is just a rehearsed, choreographed, uh, mechanical replication of what was learned. Um, and this means that it is not so much what movement you're doing. You could be doing something as linear and repetitive as push-ups, but how you're approaching it. Are you feeling those push-ups? Um, what, what quality do you want those push-ups to help you to cultivate through practicing them? is different to just showing up to a circuit class where the timer's going and you're just thrashing out as many as you can. Um, and then you can tell your friends the number that you did. Um, and usually you don't feel that great afterwards anyway. Movement should ask of you attention and creativity. and a childlike openness with curiosity, looking at the world with fresh eyes. Mechanical movement versus mindful movement. The process of re-educating neuromuscular patterns is essentially a creative one. 
intuition and imagination play key roles in transforming anatomical information into bodily experience. The inner wisdom of the imagination and intuition must be gently harnessed rather than willfully forced. This means developing a trusting relationship with the inner self and being open to the forces other than one's will. This quote is from a really awesome anatomy book that was um, uh, recommended to me by my own teacher, Josef Ruczek, who was also presenting on this summit. And it was extremely helpful, the book itself, for repatterning how I approached uh, posture and movement when I was seeking creativity, um, when that was really missing. And it's still a, a work in progress for me but it really um, helped to see that what we manifest physically comes from something internal that is also higher than the self. Um, and I will go into this a little more as we go ahead um, when I speak about training with other people, um, and right now, let's use the example of being in nature. We are an extension of nature itself. So if we go um, and approach a field or a tree and decide to have a spontaneous movement practice, things will come from within that are connected to what is around you in a way that the rational mind doesn't uh, process fast enough or it's a different part of the mind that is working so through connecting with our imagination and intuition things that we did not imagine were possible become possible physically and as we keep repeating them um, our physiological structures change our skills change and this was present when i was fighting because fighting is a, a creative um, improvisation on the spot. I will connect these points a bit more uh, logically in a moment. So here I wanted to share a video of some of my training from a few years ago. And I'm not saying that the movements are uh, completely mechanical, but my state in practicing them was entirely mechanical. Uh, yes. Apologies if the internet quality is so so, but it should be all right. So here I was just chasing a checklist of goals, ticking them, um, feeling that if I got stronger and better at them, that I would be more fulfilled or more content. But there was a lot of misery. Um, and obviously there was good stuff like empowerment and uh, achievement, but it was definitely not for a higher self. Um, I, I, I stopped them because I hit a point where I was investing many hours and a lot of energy and accumulating a little bit of injuries, nothing too bad. They, they are also um, like good for the joints in some ways, but I had no idea why I was practicing them and my quality of life did not go up. Um, I just got more attached to those achievements and suffered any time that I would uh, not perform as well. So the journey that, um, that we want to move towards. Philosophies and styles of practice that don't serve you become obvious when you approach them from a place of wanting to improve your sensitivity, your awareness of your inner voice, and to be able to express creatively. So that's where in the training that I was doing before, these things were missing for me personally. Um, I was not becoming more sensitive. The sensitivity was going away because that had to be that as well as my own inner voice were kind of shut off so that I could just power ahead and achieve certain goals. 
And there was no creativity because there was only repetition at the time. And that was not the only training I was doing at the time. There were things that appeared more creative, but ultimately it was a lot of mechanical repetition regardless of how um, open or closed the movement looked. Traveling down one path for a period of time gives you principles that you can benefit from applying to other areas of life. So this is something that I started thinking a lot about during the time when I was fighting. Um, a lot of friends would be baffled at how I could be so nervous and afraid to go to a job interview to chat with someone in a suit while I was completely comfortable going in the ring and having someone try to knock me out by kicking me in the head or kneeing me in the gut. Um, so I was thinking about how do I uh, transfer like uh, a certain quality I can develop in one area and how do I transfer it to another area? And you have to stay long enough on one, one practice, one kind of, um, yeah, a kind of practice so that you get deep enough into the principles that they become a part of you and then you can actually transfer them elsewhere. So move, I see movement practice as a committed relationship that matures over time. So you show up day by day and, um, and just do the work, but um, from a higher place. And that relationship ultimately ends up being with yourself. And you grow through that journey, through uh, practicing uh, by yourself or hopefully also with others. Um, it is both an internal and an external journey that happens. principles that I did gain from fighting. So here um, I use the example of fighting because that's something I spent a bit more time doing and uh, it was easier for me to draw parallels from where the outer work uh, drew out or enhanced already existing inner qualities that are, were very much welcome in my life. observation so that's something that um i have spoken about quite a bit and definitely when you are practicing or especially when you're fighting you need to be fully present and observe uh, your opponent or your training partner or your coach very intently to then be able to um, make sound decisions discipline Another area that's been spoken about, very important, because without that, you, you don't get very far. Um, it, it remains, again, in the ideas part. And, um, yeah, it is showing up for yourself and for your friends consistently. And that creates this beautiful journey of growth and transformation. Being non-reactive that was a big one um, and being half Italian, half Chinese, there would be cultural conditionings where uh, emotions run strong and they are expressed, especially from the Italian side. And when, when I was fighting, I immediately, it was instant learned that that's just not, um, it's not possible. You do not survive if every time you get hit, you you wince or whinge or or um, display the um, the kind of complaining that's going on internally. So it's not about suppressing the reactions, but uh, being aware of them and being able to watch them from an objective place and carrying on with a task that it is requiring your attention and your energy. Um, so fighters will say like, oh, you need to have a poker face. And that's true because regardless of how you're feeling, the job needs to be done. So you might as well be cool about it. Adaptability 
every moment is fresh. You have to be present in every moment. And as much as you may plan and prepare and work really hard for something, like I was maybe working on a certain footwork uh, to counter a kick or a knee for six weeks in the, the um, martial arts center, when I would go to, into the ring, I wouldn't know if it would work. And perhaps it would have no relationship to what needed to be done. And in the moment, you have to adapt and just go with the flow. So again, really observing um, and adapting to each present moment. Uh, a s nice little story that I'd like to share was when I first went to Thailand to fight uh, from Hong Kong, it was a very different style of organization. So in Hong Kong, you would have um, you'd arrive a few hours early, you would have a schedule, even a walkout rehearsal and a changing room, and your coach would warm you up, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then when I moved to Thailand, um, it was quite a shock and great for me to just, again, not be reactive and be completely adaptable because you would arrive at the venue, especially at uh, entry level fight. Um, and you would not know who you were fighting, what weight they were, what time you would fight, if you got a warm up at all. And that was very, very disturbing for me because I, I wanted to have some kind of control around it. Um, but it was also the best thing for me because basically you show up ready and you have trained for many weeks and prepared for that. So what is the problem? How does uh, fighting at 8 p.m. or midnight really change much? That's what you're there for, and you're there to go with the flow. Um, there is no script. Humility. So you win some, you lose some. Um, again, early on in fighting, I had a nice winning streak where I felt really great and then I had a losing streak and that was quite crushing um, and the the humility was about letting go to of the outcome and doing my best and realizing that the reason why I would fight was really for the love of the practice and the feeling that I had in the ring with these amazing opponents that I was gifted um, the opportunity to share the ring with. And, um, and also as you get hit a lot, it's, it's, it's a very primal kind of humbling, like especially when you get hit in the face, it's very obvious um, that you've not done so well. And again, just being okay with that, smiling and carrying on. Resilience. Um, necessary for fighting and for life. Patience, another one. We cannot rush or, uh, again, program things for how ex to be exactly as we want them. Even um, getting fights, for example. Initially, I was hoping to fight every month, but realistically, I got maybe two fights a year initially. And each of the other fights I would have prepared for, trained for very hard, and they would fall through. And um, my younger self would throw emotional tantrums rather than just wait it out and wait for the best opportunity that was waiting for me. Perseverance, going with discipline. So if you're tired or you're your leg hurts, you just keep going um, for yourself and for your friends. And again, it's not a suppression or a neglecting of what you're feeling, but deciding that you, you can be your best, that you are strong and resilient and, and you're there, you show up for yourself and you show up for others. Empathy, this is something that non-martial artists may not uh, see as a quality that fighters have, but that's one of the biggest ones um, because you're always in it together, even if it's an opponent and you, you, you're so connected that you feel what they feel. And, um, and this goes also with the coach, with the training partners. Um, and it's a very important quality that has come out in my teaching maybe one of the most important ones.
respect. There is a lot of respect between opponents and training buddies. You need each other. Without each other, there is no progress. Facing fears. Um, again, showing up when you don't want to show up. I was always scared before fighting. I was also scared before coming to this presentation, but knowing that it's for a higher purpose um, shows how irrelevant or small the feelings and emotions that come up are when you have to show up for something that is um, bigger than yourself. Acceptance of everything as it is. Playfulness. This I will also discuss shortly. Learning and practicing with others. You will not get far doing it alone. We as human beings are tribal creatures. We, we like and we need community. We need those um, each other as reference points and we are mirrors for each other. So we have inspiration and all kinds of other things being transmitted across from one being to another. We need each other for self-reflecting. And there is strength through diversity. So if you look now during these interesting times of the coronavirus, how important is it to have friends? So during times of crisis, this is exposed and amplified, but it's always there. Um, perhaps you have one friend that will give you toilet paper, the other one gives you food, another one gives you information that can save your or someone else's life, or you can be there for someone else. So we again want to avoid a monotone existence and have bring all our different strengths and um, qualities to be shared so that we all uplift one another playing. One of the most effective ways I've found to have speedy progress on the playing field of life is through playing. It is wired into all mammals DNA to learn through playing, which is why so much growth happens there. And again, those qualities that that um, we covered empathy, respect, uh, sensitivity, uh, observation, um, you know, your own inner, your own strength and weaknesses, all of these get pulled out when you play. Um, there's a lot of incredible transmission that happens when we play. And somehow adults are not encouraged to play again, part of the illness, but we should not stop playing. With others to become a better human awesome traits brought out of you through engaging with others. The desire to imitate through being inspired. So you see someone else do something really beautiful and there's this desire to imitate. And as you actually go through those steps where you observe and process and then take action, you actually start to embody those qualities in your own way. Healthy competitiveness. We have this all the time. Um, and if you're not a movement person, you may have it in your work or in, in a game elsewhere. And that's, again, competition being used to bring the best out of you rather than hoping that the other person doesn't do well. Empathy, seeing beyond yourself, caring for one another and fueling growth through this uh, safe space where where you can be vulnerable and work on your weaknesses and, and empower each other. And all these qualities ultimately are hopefully transferable outside of movement practice. So it does empathy come out in your marriage enough or with your colleagues at work. So these are all things that I start to think about um, how I can transfer these kind of, qualities and memory files across the board of my life rather than just stay in one area. Perspective, seeing how big the world is in relation to your world. And this is again, being with others, we need to be with people that are different to us. Otherwise, our perspective can become very small and 
usually leads to being egocentric and and miserable as a result so we need perspective from each other honesty others call you out on your shit and keep you accountable and this is what family and friends and your tribe do for you and you do for them watching and understanding your inner dialogue through interacting with others so i love uh the saying how you can uh meditate in a cave or on a mountain or you like but can you apply those same qualities of peace and compassion and bliss while you're having uh dinner with your family and some of them are arguing or while you are wrestling with someone and you're losing so um yeah it's watching the inner dialogue and seeing how can i repattern it make it serve me and serve others empowerment seeing that you are more powerful and able than your mind would have you believe and again we get inspired the competition pulls the best out of us we want to inspire others so we start to make the impossible possible and act it out and yes <laughs> humility not becoming arrogant as someone will always put you in your place nothing is linear working with others draws out your inner dialogue and exposes your thoughts for what they are and they are basically just accumulated stories from the past so as you work on this you can actually start to create a different future for yourself and that's how we see people achieve amazing things they they somehow can reprogram um their mind's habits and have uh like positive expansive new habits that change their reality they have to first believe in it and then work on it on the playing field it is crucial to observe how we speak to ourselves in real time so not sitting in your bedroom reading a self-help book but actually out in the world and interacting with people and the environment only when there is awareness can we open the door to inner transformation practicing with others can help you to break limiting habits and you can also co-create with them so again this is all relating to movement i really loved this um video those of you that have practiced or studied with me know how much i love uh working with feet um specifically because they carry us through life and i just wanted to share a few seconds of this clip with you it's called awesomeness or i have named it awesomeness Nous sommes nous sommes nous venons de la Côte d'Ivoire précisément à dans la à Boaké Quelqu'un qui te le chant quelqu'un qui te chant le soir il vient on si sont pas fatigués ils se réunissent et puis ils commencent à danser au clair de lune et jusque là ils ont pu à créer okay so movement really is about celebrating life isn't it miraculous that you even have something called feet Do you pay attention and feel gratitude or are they just another body part that work well for some things and not so well for others? So again if you think of a small child learning how to use his or her hand initially um there is this magical wonder and like bottomless determination to learn how to articulate the fingers and hold and grab stuff and then start to create more refined movements and the same goes with the feet or all the other body parts that we have but somehow as we become more skillful they become mundane and we just take it for granted 
Um, and if we neglect them enough, we also start to lose a lot of abilities, which happens a lot as people age. So it's, again, paying attention. And with, through those child eyes, it is not possible to not have gratitude for what we have um, in the simplest of ways. Movement should be used as a vehicle for empowerment. We need to embody the concepts that inspire us to celebrate what we are. We need to match our walk to our talk. We need to move towards our higher self. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you, and Sasha. I actually did it in time, which is amazing. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Um, right away from the start, I thought it was cool. We had that idea of the, the small self and the big self. And if you go back to John Verbeke's talk, uh, the being mode and the having mode, and that idea of that modal confusion that we have, I think you see an echo of that here as well, which is it's cool to see these themes playing out. And then um, with Ryan Hurst and with, uh, with Paul Cech, so much emphasis on that idea of awareness. And through all these, the question of the practice, is it a place where you harvest things that help you become the person that you want to be? Or is the place where you hide from the person that you are outside of that practice? 